Thank you. Uh, I want to start by thanking uh, the organizers for uh, this opportunity to speak here. Uh, it's very nice to see uh, a lot of talks already on open quantum systems. Uh, of course, I also realize that uh, my talk is, you know, it's a kind of uh, too big of a title. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to focus uh, the discussions on quantum algorithms for Lindblad simulations. And then the second part of my talk is going to be about uh, modeling uh, and simulating non-Markovian open quantum systems. All right, and so I think previous speakers have addressed this issue, uh, like why do we want to look at open quantum systems? And so this is because in reality, most of the quantum systems that we are looking at are actually interacting with an environment. And those interactions can uh, lead to a lot of uh, um, sort of a physical phenomena that we have to uh, take into account. Now, uh, in terms of... Uh, Deriving an appropriate model for open quantum systems, uh, we usually start with a combined system where you put in your system that you're interested in and together with the VAP, right? And of course, simulating this directly uh, is usually difficult, and I think uh, um, Andres ha has this reference. I think that's, some, that's a really nice uh, reference to look into. Um, and and, and uh, overall, the theory of open quantum systems is about um, identifying or deriving an appropriate model uh, for your quantum system where you do not have to explicitly keep track of the bad degrees of freedom. Right? So uh, in a nutshell, that's kind of what is going on. I want to use a very simple example. So this is the simplest example that I can construct. And it's the following. So let's say that you have a, just a, a one qubit, right? And so this is the simple Hamiltonian. And you can start out with uh, this initial quantum state, right? And then uh, you can just let, let the system run. And so this is, this is happening without the interactions with uh, a, uh, an environment, right? And so the dynamics is fairly boring. So if you take out the x, y, and z components, uh, what you're getting is this, this uh, perfect circle on the block sphere, right? So this is, you know, so you do that by solving the time-dependent Schrodinger equation with this simple Hamiltonian. Now, if you, then if you expose this system to an environment, and then what happens is that due to the interactions with uh, the environment, um, your system is going to be subject to noise, right? And so uh, over here, uh, I'm, I took this particular model from this paper, and later I'm gonna show you the explicit forms uh, and then what the, the model is, uh, by taking into account the influence of the environment, the model becomes a stochastic Schrodinger equation. And because of the stochastic effect, uh, what you're looking at is actually just one realization of this trajectory. And so uh, you, you're going to see a lot of wiggles, a lot of noises. Um, and this is, uh, you get this noise even when the interaction is rather weak. For example, here the coupling constant is only one tenth. Um, so basically, this is an ensemble of uh, pure states. And so if you take the average of that and look at the average um, x, y, and z components, and this is what's going on. So instead of following a perfect, per perfect circle, you're starting to see a drift in the z direction. Right? And this is not because of the numerical error. So you can try the best numerical method that you have, and you're still seeing uh, this drift in the vertical direction. Okay? And, um, and later, uh, we're going to show that uh, this is actually a non-Markovian process in the sense that the stochastic Schrodinger equation here has a memory effect. And uh, we can derive a quantum master equation to model that. And so you can actually predict this path by solving the uh, quantum master equation. Okay. Now, um, outside of quantum computing, uh, there are many other applications of uh, open quantum systems. So I just want to list them here, um, just in case that you have a very robust algorithm for solving Lindblad equations, and you're looking for applications outside of quantum computing. Right? And so these are some of the original applications and uh, the first time that I saw Lindblad equation is actually from material science, where people solve electron transport problems. And you're, you, in here, you place your device um, in, a, 
extended quantum system and you're kind of trying to uh, look for the, uh, let's say, the current at the steady state and things like that. And so here, um, there were some interesting proposals um, in terms of using the Lindblad equation either to connect the uh, uh, equilib uh, non-equilibrium Green's function or like really just extend the density functional theory and the time-dependent density functional theory. So there are a lot of interesting works over there. Now, the outline of my talk is the following. So um, I'm going to first follow, I think, uh, probably Jane Feng's uh, path and so talk about the uh, Markovian dynamics, how to derive the Markovian dynamics from the combined quantum system, but I'm going to keep this discussion very formal and very short so that we can see this passage from a combined quantum system uh, to the Lindblad equation. Right. And then I'll talk about the quantum algorithms, and so I think this has been mentioned in previous talks, and so um, I'll talk about like a first order scheme first. So this is a, just a, an illustration to see how you can kind of uh, construct uh, a quantum channel representation of the uh, Lindblad equation, and then I'm going to talk about how to come up with the high order um, methods so that you can reduce the overall complexity. Now, I'm going to place my, the emphasis more on the non-Markovian dynamics. So um, I'll talk about uh, our derivation of non-Markovian models using the stochastic unraveling technique. So this is working with um, uh, the wave function rather than the density operator. Okay? And that comes with uh, several advantages that I'm going to explain. Um, and so the end result of this is going to be a generalization of the Lindblad equation. And so typically, this type of equations are uh, called generalized quantum master equations. And uh, uh, you'll see that the form of this is very similar to Lindblad. It's just that it's, uh, uh, it has higher dimensions, but you can use the same quantum algorithms for this. Okay. Now, uh, again, so this kind of discussion often starts with a combined system where you explicitly represent the bath variables, but this is only for the derivation purpose. It's not something that we are going to simulate directly. And so basically, you're lumping your system and the quantum bath together, and you ignore everything else. And so you regard this as a complete system, which follows a unitary dynamics, and uh, here I'm using sort of the density operator uh, form, and so this follows this unitary uh, uh, evolution, okay? And the initial um, state of this is prepared so that the uh, bath is in a thermal equilibrium, and your initial state is a tensor product of those. Okay. Now, in the end, what you care about is only the dynamics of the system, right? So once you kind of write down this gigantic uh, dynamics, uh, you only want to uh, uh, take out uh, the stuff that you care about, and that is done by using this partial trace by taking out the bath degrees of freedom, right? Now, this can be represented in a quantum uh, channel form. For example, uh, you can write down, so just by following these formulas, you can write down an exact Krauss form representation that maps the initial uh, density operator rho s of zero to uh, rho s of t, right? And this is known already. But of course, these cross operators are very complicated, right? There's a lot of terms. Um, now, to look at, to get a quick idea about, let me see, I don't know why it's, uh, how to, like, go from this, uh, well, there are two approaches, actually. So the first approach is, um, in this paper, um, they, they um, came up with a, the method of averaging approach, um, and they actually derived the Lindblad equation based off of this uh, Krauss form. Okay. Um, and the other derivation is based on, um, uh, uh, you basically, uh, you uh, change your density uh, operator to the frame of the interaction picture, meaning that um, you introduce this unitary and look, and, and you notice that this unitary, in this unitary, this Hamiltonian doesn't have the interaction term, right? And so you move your density operator in that frame, and by doing that, you eliminate the first two terms in the uh, uh, Hamiltonian, and so you're working with this equation right here, okay? And uh, to derive uh, the Lindblad equation, uh, one usually need 
two assumptions. One is the weak coupling, where you, you assume that this lambda is much, much less than one. And the other assumption is that uh, the bath, um, the, the time scale associated with the, uh, the bath dynamics is much faster, right? And so you can see that from here. So uh, what you can do is you can kind of write the, your solution in this integral form and then plug it back in. And so uh, you're going to come up with this equation, okay? And the first term dropped out because, it, because you can actually, uh, so there was a, this uh, interaction uh, term and so you, can re you can always subtract a constant times identity from B and so you can annihilate that term. And so by assuming that lambda is a small parameter, namely weak coupling, you can do a, an asymptotic uh, expansion of this and you can plug it in. That's the first thing that can happen. And, and to the leading order, you're looking for this sort of tensor product form. And then what happens is that if you uh, arrange them together, and so remember these are also in tensor product form. So if you take a partial trace of this, you're going to see the, um, this time correlation function emerging, right? So this B of T is the dynamics uh, following the uh, Bath uh, Hamiltonian. And so at that point, you're seeing this integral term, right? That's an indication of a non-Markovian dynamics. But if you assume that uh, the Bath correlation has a very small correlation length, in other words, this, um, this is close to, let's say, some number times a delta function, then uh, you can knock out this integral term and you come up with this. And then you change it back to the original frame and that's actually the Lindblad equation. Mm -hmm. Notation-wise, uh, mm -hmm. when you have a bracket, three things, that's nested. All right, so, so that be, means these two are, you, okay. yeah, that's together. So it depends on like different communities. I realize that in different communities, people use different notations and in, in some communities, this just by default means that the, uh, these two are in one bracket. All right, and of course the rigorous uh, proof for some uh, specific models, uh, you can, you can uh, I think Jen Feng already talked about this. Okay. But intuitively that's what's happening. So basically uh, you need two assumptions. One is the scale separation assumption and the other is the weak coupling assumption. And so toward the end of my talk, uh, we'll try to remove these conditions and so we can remove the second assumption completely for the first one, uh, we can improve it a little bit. It, we cannot completely uh, eliminate that uh, constraint. Okay. And so um, now the other alternative is uh, to follow uh, Lindblad and say, okay, if this is a, uh, Markovian, so you have a generator, and uh, if dynamics is CPTP, and then you're guaranteed that the equation for real is going to look like this. Right? So this, you don't have to say that this came out of this system plus that bath. Right? So you can just write it down um, um, exactly. But on the other hand, uh, these jump operators may not have a direct connection to the application that you're studying. So this is universal, but it could be like, you know, uh, too, too general and it's kind of detached from what you want to study. Okay. Now, of course, the uh, one natural question sort of from numerical analysis viewpoint is that, so here you went from a CPTP to the Lindblad equation. But uh, the, uh, this, uh, um, and here they used uh, the Krauss form in the derivation. And so the question is whether you can actually go from the Lindblad equation and derive a Krauss form. And so that has been done. So for the simplest thing that you can do is like you can start with the Euler's method, right? And then, uh, but here this is not exactly a cross form because over here you have the identity times rho n and this is rho n times the identity, right? So it's not exactly the cross form. But you can kind of, since the Euler's method is like a first order method to begin with, so you are allowed to add and subtract an order delta t square term and so you can make it a, a cross form like this. So that's like one you know, simple way to derive sort of a, a crude approximation that's in a cross form. But of course, if you try high order ODE methods and try to rearrange these terms to a cross form, it's much harder, okay? So you need some other uh, route, okay? Okay. Um, so the reason that we uh, uh, consider the qu uh, quantum algorithms for Lindblad equation is that, uh, of course, there are some obvious reasons. Uh, people often argue that quantum computing algorithms are natural for 
quantum chemistry problems, right? So that's one way. And also this uh, Lindblad equation is also a natural extension of Hamiltonian simulations, right? So you have these added uh, jump operator terms. Uh, but on the other hand, if you look at how this is done uh, classically, you either solve the corresponding stochastic Schrodinger equation or you solve the Lindblad equation um, in its uh, original form, but it's gonna have a lot of matrix vector multiplications, okay? And so, you're try and so our hope is to um, have a quantum algorithm that can kind of have uh, much less dependence on the dimension, All right? Now, there are many existing works, and so it's a lot more than uh, what I listed here. And so, uh, but I kind of pick, um, pick these three just so to show the connection between the typical representations of a, of a quantum channel and the, uh, uh, let's say the starting point of the numerical methods, right? So typically there are four forms of the uh, of quantum channels, and three of them have been used so far. At least I don't know if anybody used the Troy form, but the th three of them have been used. Um, and uh, um, here I'm only going to discuss algorithms have, that have um, explicit complexity estimates. All right, and so um, uh, previous talks have, talk, uh, have mentioned uh, uh, some of the previous works about using cross form, and uh, let, let, let me explain uh, what we have done. Uh, we can, you can design this in a time marching fashion so that um, you, in the end, you only have to think about uh, your numerical approximation within one step. And so within one step, uh, one kind of first order approximation is the following, and this is kind of neat, and uh, it, it, although it's only first order, right, uh, is, uh, this is actually in the paper of uh, Cleveland One, uh, where uh, you come up with this uh, stein spring form where uh, you try to kind of look at this uh, in a slightly bigger dimension, and uh, you, in that, in that uh, larger space, you uh, follow a unitary dynamics. And this unitary dynamics is, uh, driven by this particular Hamiltonian where you take all the jump operators and line them up in the first column and the first row so that you make a Hamiltonian out of it. And you can do this part separately, but you can also keep it in here. And uh, this it has an error that's uh, uh, only first order, so the global error is gonna be T delta T, but this is still a very neat uh, algorithm. So okay. for, for the missing part, it doesn't matter what you put there. Uh, they are all, the rest of them are zeros. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, there are, there are uh, some improved uh, algorithms uh, using this stein spring form, and this is in the uh, Tong Yang Li and uh, Andrew Charles paper. And so these methods are essentially second order, and that's why you're seeing uh, this complexity. Okay. And what I'm gonna tell you about is a, um, uh, a method that has um, complexity that's linear in time, but logarithmic in terms of one over epsilon, and we do have this uh, m uh, dependence in front. So this m comes from uh, the, num the number of jump operators. And so this was, uh, uh, th this was discussed in the previous uh, talk by Andres. So what is little q? The what? Little q here in the last slide. The, the, the q? Yeah, q. Uh, let's see, what was the q? Uh, Oh yeah, right here. Yeah, I should write it here. This is the Q, uh, it's Q, Q polys. So the, the jump operators are written in terms of Q polys. So now I remember. So uh, that was the input model. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for asking. I, I suddenly I forgot. <laughs> uh, um, all right, and so um, since uh, uh, and, and this paper and by Cleve and Wan uh, used the first order uh, uh, methods, and, uh, but uh, in the end, they can uh, achieve this complexity by a, comp a compression scheme. And so this is also discussed in previous talks. Just one log factor? The what? Just one log factor? Uh, there could be a high order term, yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah. It's not polyvolved? It's, uh, oh. I actually don't remember. I don't remember. I mean, that originally. It's not the polylog right? Okay, okay, yeah, you might be right. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we are looking for is a high order approximation so that we can avoid the uh, compression scheme. And so for this part, uh, we're, uh, we uh, sort of piggybacked on a Jane approach where uh, you 
take the Lindblad operator and you separate it into two terms. And so we called the first term the drift term, where you have a non-hermation part. And then the second part is sort of the jump part, where you have uh, this particular form. And, and then you can use uh, Duhamel's principle by writing down the solution in this form. This is, only an, this is not an explicit form of the solution, but it's kind of an integral form of uh, the density operator solution. And then you repeat this, so every time you do it, it spits out an integral. And so in the end, you're gonna come up with many, many uh, integrals. Um, let's see if I can do it, okay. And until you get enough terms. So enough meaning that the remaining term is less than epsilon, and so here you can set k to be um, um, uh, a log, uh, I think it's on the order for log of one over epsilon. Um, and then, uh, so I think the main observation in Jen Feng's approach is the following, right? So if you look at each of these uh, terms in the integrals, um, you see this alternating pattern. And for each of these uh, operators, uh, this is where the density operator is sandwiched between two jump operators, and so that's a cross form. And then uh, for this operator over here, uh, this is naturally like an exponential on the left, and it's staggered on the right, and this is also a cross form. So, and the composition is also a cross form. And so putting all together, uh, what you get is a cross form representation. Of course, it automatically guarantees the complete positive uh, property of the solution map. Um, so that's kind of the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, starting point of this method. And at the end, end of the day, you're gonna have to kind of get your hands dirty and kind of uh, approximate this, right? And so this looks very much like the Dyson series approach for Hamiltonian simulations. So what we decided to do at this point to, is the following. Since you're seeing a lot of the terms here, so we kind of have to keep the number of terms here small, right? To do that, um, we use the Gaussian quadrature to minimize the number of terms here. And so uh, here, uh, these are the quadrature points and these are the weights, and then it has this uh, you know, uh, error, uh, uh, form of the quadrature error, and so you plug it in, so the, all the integrals will be reduced to these sums, right? Now, in order to use this algorithm, it's also important to estimate these coefficients. And so, uh, thanks to the uh, uh, Gaussian quadratures, uh, we actually have exact uh, identities for these weights, and they are uh, looking like this. And so, therefore, um, in, the, uh, in the approximating the integrals, you don't need many quadrature points, right? And so uh, they are both on the order of log of one over epsilon. Okay. Um, and so in the end, you just get a sort of a, like a big cross form uh, the, with many, many cross operators. So, uh -huh, yeah. so in the picking of the of principle, you mm -hmm. have different time periods. Yeah. But in the cross form, you need the matrix on left and right to be exactly the same, right? The right, they are exactly the same. Exactly yeah, the yeah, same. yeah, yeah, that's right. So because every time you play this game of uh, uh, putting row between these two, and then, uh, and then, uh, so sorry, and then you put a row uh, between these two. So it's. You don't have this formula at the top, that's also the same thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right, that's right, yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, but, uh, you know, in practice, sometimes you do see, if you derive it from some other approaches, you do see operators that are different. Uh, the ones on the left and on the right are different. In some derivations, those forms are called uh, non-diagonal forms. So, so you can kind of try to diagonalize it. So instead of having the, I don't know if I have a, an equation for the cross form, but you would have like, let's say, LJ and LK dagger, and like AJ and K, and you, you just have to diagonalize that matrix to make it a diagonal form. Okay. Um, so uh, implementation-wise, uh -huh. you have discrete heights, how right. can you do it? Oh yeah, so this is just uh, you know. Uh, so first, the, you you first block encode these uh, individual uh, the uh, uh, jump operators, right? And then the way that you do it is actually here, right? So, so intuitively, what you can think about is uh, forget about the block encoding, right? So you can uh, come up with uh, this uh, a unitary, and effectively, uh, effectively, what it does is that uh, let's say that row is let's say a row is. Uh, you know, it's a, you write it as psi and psi dagger, and what this effectively does is to apply the uh, cross operators on psi, 
And then you do, do Poseidon, Poseidon dagger, and trace out the uh, ancilla, and that's going to be the cross form. Oh, I mean, in terms of all these uh, different time points, how, how do you control them? Uh, different time points. Also, you don't have a clock, but uh, you have uh, all this J, J, K minus 1. Oh, these are, yeah. so, so uh, yeah. So th that's why they have these funny indices. So let's say that you have a double integral, right? But this integral, this is like, sort of like a uh, time-ordered operator in the sense that the second uh, integral only goes up to, let's say, t, right? So the first one from 0 to t, and the second one has to go from uh, 0 to t1 or something like that, right? And so each one has different that, uh, it's a scaled. It's so scaled. it's all like compressed a little each time. That's right. So that's what. These, uh, these notations are for. Uh, they were defined recursively. Yeah, and yeah. is that easy to implement this thing? Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, oh, oh, oh you, uh, well, in the, in the end, I, I, I don't know how, like, what do you mean by easy? Uh, uh, it's doable, oh, but. Okay. <laughs> I just mean how to do it, because uh, okay. before, if you do a uniform grid, the circuit mm -hmm. looks like you have a bunch of adders. That's right, that's right. And this one, how do we do it? Um, you have some non-trivial weights, you have some non-trivial uh -huh. right, 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 right. Well, in the end, it's just going to be, um, um, I actually don't remember. Uh, that's, that's a good question. Uh, it's my LCU. No, why can't LCU? It is LCU, uh, LCU yeah, but. It's just a of yeah, yeah, yeah. Why not LCU? It is LCU. Mm -hmm. But I thought you were trying to say, like, how do you keep track of the... Yeah, but this uh, product of W is weight. You still have, to have a special prepare oracle. To do it. Uh, like, how do you yeah. get this W or J? No, no, no. No. When you do the LC, there's a coefficient, and uh, right. there's a special prepare oracle. Kind of. Okay, I'm not familiar with that part. <laughs> so, but uh, they do add up very nicely. So you can control the, the uh, so that you, these coefficients um, you know, add up to some fixed number. Could you factorize the f into the number of terms by pairing it up with w? Because if you could do that, then you could do a factorized LCU and it would reduce. Sorry, what was the? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So if, if you could factorize the f. Factorize the f. You okay. could linearize the LCU. So the, the Fs are basically, it came from here, so it has these alternating patterns, and so you do each one of them, but you kind of do it repeatedly. It came from there. Okay. LJ is not unit, <laughs> right? So LJ is what? Uh, LJ is... Uh, sorry, you have a LD. LD is the... LD. Uh, Which ones are the, uh, the non permission Oh, this one is. This one is. LD is non permission That's right. And yes. LJ is. Uh, are, are the jump operators. The jump. So, yeah. All right. So mm -hmm. every time. Uh, how do you implement this uh, e to the LD? Oh, the, this one is like just Dyson series, right? Or Taylor expansion. Taylor. Oh, yeah, okay. so it's Taylor. The truncated Dyson, mm -hmm. inside there is a truncated Taylor. Uh, right, but that's, you just use the same truncation over here and here so that it's still a cross form. Right. Uh, I, I don't quite understand. So, so, so D is a, a Hamiltonian simulation of a non Hermitian matrix. Right, but these are all like block encoded. Block encoded. That's right. So the input model is like the block encoding of H and LJ. And maybe I should have said that to begin with. And you're going to do a truncated Taylor. That's right. That's right. That's right. So D is going to be like uh, also a kth order Taylor. Right, right. So, so it is indeed a truncated mm -hmm. Dyson inside for each of them is a truncated Taylor. That's right. That's and right. the LJ is just a block encoding. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So in the end, uh, so uh, the complexity comes out to be a linear in, in terms of time. And then this norm came out of the block encoding. So in the block encoding, you need to upper bound the spectral norms, and so these are sort of the, the, the bounds of those norms. So uh, we use this measure uh, in the uh, error analysis, and also this also comes up in the uh, final complexity. Okay, oh, okay, so the, the second part
part is uh, the non-Markovian part. Right? So the previous part is about like taking the Lindblad equation for granted and uh, try to come up with an algorithm that, solve, that solves it. And the second part is uh, to uh, think about the regime where the Lindblad equation doesn't apply. Right? So, so you could lose one of those assumptions. One is that uh, you no longer have a weak coupling. So maybe lambda is not that small or you don't have scale separation, okay? Um, and uh, so there are um, so, uh, quite a few applications where uh, people kind of really uh, care about this non-Markovian regime. And for example, there are a lot of experimental evidence where uh, people actually observe uh, these non-Markovian properties by looking at certain spectral densities. Um, and there's also interesting works to kind of measure non-Markovianity, and so I'm not quite familiar uh, with exactly how it's done, but it's, they want to put a number to it. <laughs> like, you know, how non-Markovian? And, and that's also kind of interesting. And uh, uh, there are also, like, um, you know, what I'm going to talk about is how to derive a non-Markovian uh, model for a uh, two-model equanimum system. Now, uh, intuitively, uh, people usually, so, uh, you know, uh, the, under, the common understanding is that the, the challenge here is that uh, there's a backflow of information. So previously, your system can do something nice, and then it's going to have an effect on the environment, but the environment is not going to punch back, right? And so it's just a one-way sort of a, a, a communication. But this is where uh, the environment and the bat can communicate back and forth, right? And um, the other thing that's different from the Markovian regime is that uh, there's no universal form for the quantum master equation. And so people can come up with different ones. And some of them have you know, some set of nice properties, and others have their other nice properties, and they also have disadvantage, disadvantages and advantages. Now, one of the challenges that we found by going through a lot of models is uh, uh, that a lot, of the, uh, a lot of them do not preserve the completely positive uh, property. And so this might be okay in the classical simulation. Maybe you don't care much about that. But for, uh, if we want to implement this on quantum computers, this is definitely a property that we want to have. Um, and because we are looking at the interactions, explicit interactions between the system and the bath, uh, we're going to have to see um, the properties of the bath. So you're going to see the the properties of the bath showing up in the quantum master equation. So in other words, if you're interacting with a different bath, your equation is going to be different. Okay? And so that's one thing that, you, that I want to kind of prepare you uh, before we go to the uh, next uh, slide. Uh, my approach for this is, uh, uh, is stochastic unraveling. So this is kind of uh, taking advantage of the connection between Lindblad equation and the stochastic Schrodinger equation. And so my hope is that uh, we can find some stochastic Schrodinger equations to model non-Markovian dynamics. And then I can use the uh, stochastic Schrodinger equation to write down the quantum mass equation and then go from there. Right? Now, um, and here is a candidate. Okay? And this was derived in 1999. Um, so um, what this uh, group, uh, well, before that, let me talk about this. So that's the next slide. So, for example, in the Markovian regime, um, there is this uh, correspondence between the Lindblad equation and the stochastic Schrodinger equation. So what you're seeing here is that uh, this is the system Hamiltonian part. So without the re remaining terms, this is just the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. And uh, because of the, uh, the jump operators and the environment, uh, um, the in interactions with the environment, uh, what you're picking up is this non-Hermitian part in the drift component and also this random noise term, right? And so what I'm using here is the Edo form of the stochastic differential equation, but you can also use um, uh, stochastic equations driven by jump uh, processes. Okay. And one thing that you see is that this is a linear uh, system of differential equations with a white noise, right? Now, uh, just like in the Hamiltonian case, one thing that you might want to have is like, an explicit form of the solution, right? For example, if you only have the Schrodinger equation, then you can write down the unitary, which is u e to the negative i t h, right? Now, if h is time dependent, 
uh, you want to write down this uh, time ordered uh, evolution operator, right? But what if you add uh, the noise term, right? In this case, you can also write down an, the, an exponential form of the solution operator, and this is kind of taking the idea from uh, Kunita of uh, uh, stochastic flow. And so uh, you can, uh, in general, write your solution. You can force your solution to look like an exponential times the initial condition. And in your exponential, there are a bunch of differential operators together with the time t, the, uh, the uh, y noise, and some high order stochastic integrals and high order commutators. So you can you know, continue to write this down for many, many times. Now for this particular uh, stochastic Schrodinger equation, we wrote this down. And because here we are working with just uh, the finite dimensional uh, vectors, so you can actually come up, you can convert these differential operators into matrix uh, vector products, and this is what you get. This is up to probably order delta t squared. If you continue, you can grab more terms. And so this is going to give you an explicit formula, but you know, uh, it has infinitely many terms in the exponent. But at least you have some exponential form for uh, the solution. Okay. And the connection between the uh, stochastic Schrodinger equation and the Lindblad equation is that uh, if you take the covariance uh, matrix here, um, it follows exactly the Lindblad equation, okay? And so this is known in the uh, uh, SDE literature. So as long as you have a linear SDE, it could have a multiplicative noise, then the first and second moments will satisfy a uh, closed system of equations. So it's not uh, just specific to uh, the problems in this contact, but it's actually uh, true in general. So it's kind of lumping these two uh, stochastic integrals. Okay. Right, so in the, I think in the original expression, this is like, there are, uh, I think it's like I01, I10, and then you add them up, so I combine them. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yeah. so given this, you can take expectation again like the but mm -hmm. given the body, it's not, there in many ways of. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Now, like I said, so uh, this is not going to be unique, and you can also use other noises, right? So, um, so I wouldn't say it's one-to-one -one mapping, but you know, um, so I think Lindblad corresponds to a class of unraveling uh, SEs. Okay. Uh, but this Schrodinger equation doesn't correspond to a Hermitian Hamiltonian. Uh, this one right here. Uh, I mean the one on the top, like the Hamiltonian yeah, the doesn't look Hermitian. Uh, the, the HS is Hermitian. Yeah, but the, the other terms. Right, then it's non-hermation. Right? It's non-hermation and it, uh, there's a noise here. So this reminds us of the fluctuation dissipation theorem in the uh, in classical sort of stochastic processes, right? So you have... So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, so if you look at each side T, is, it, yeah. is the norm still one? Oh, very good question. In, gen in general, no. But uh, there are some specific examples from uh, quantum electron dynamics where uh, the norm is exactly one. So it's almost surely the norm is one. But it depends on the specific examples. Mm -hmm. so, uh, mm -hmm. so in the Lindblad equation, you have the Hamiltonian, you have the L's. Here you also have the L, H and L. Yeah. What, what could be different? You, you, you said that for one Lindblad equation, you can have multiple annihilation of the Well, uh, So you can uh, use Poisson process. Oh, right? So the reason that this works is the Eto's lemma. But the Eto's lemma works the same way. So, yeah. It's a noise model. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Go ahead. So, the problem that looks like something like Baker Campbell Hausdorff ish. Sorry, let me see if I can scroll it up. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, this looks like Baker Campbell Hausdorff, sort of, if I continue this, right, in that series of nested commutators. Mm -hmm. is, that how, is that how this continues? Uh, this one here? Yeah. So, uh, this is actually very similar to Magnus expansion. Okay, cool. So I think that's the right analog. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Although classically, I mean, this is a good, could be a good scheme. Yeah. Mm -hmm. is a, quite a nightmare, right? Because uh, right. it's a non CBTP, and right, yeah, uh, yeah. you have to truncate your noise, and uh, right. you take mm -hmm. into account the worst case, the, 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 the scaling problem. Right, right. I don't, uh, I, right, right. So we did use this classically, and so. Um, but of quantum, you know, in terms of quantum algorithms, I don't know if this is a good starting point, right? Yeah. But I, I think it, it is nice, like, 
I, I do want to put it out there. Maybe somebody can come up with some nice ways to implement it directly. Right. right. That's right. So, so then what you have is if you have WJ and uh, WKs, you have the, those uh, Browning bridges that you have to take care of. So they are cross terms, WJ and WK. Yeah, but there is still the strong error kind of exceeding like one. So mm -hmm. I guess you can treat the weak better. No, I think we did uh, prove the strong error by, so, uh, so the, oh, the, 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 so you have these, uh, yeah, you have right, these right. high order. That's right, yeah. so the order barrier is, right, right because of that, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, it doesn't quite matter because you always look for expectation. I don't know, we can debate about that. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So in a stochastic Schrodinger's equation, uh -huh. um, which, which term determines it's now Markovian or Markovian? Oh, so this is Markovian. Okay, Th this, this is, is Markovian. Markovian. This is yes. Markovian. But I'm using this kind of to build a connection between the quantum master equation and the stochastic differential equations. So, so that's kind of what I'm driving at. So for in the non-Markovian case, uh, uh, on the next slide, I'm going to show a non-Markovian stochastic Schrodinger equation. And so the question is whether we can kind of uh, derive a uh, quantum master equation out of it. Okay, so that's kind of, uh, okay. Uh, okay, let's see, all right. Uh, okay, okay. Um, so there is a non-Markovian stochastic Schrodinger equation that we got from the literature. And so I'm gonna skip the, the derivation of this. I'm just gonna say that this has been derived uh, in this um, paper. Uh, where you still see this um, uh, the system Hamiltonian term, except that um, the uh, the this term here, so it used to be this non-Hermitian part, right? And you was asking about this. This suddenly becomes uh, an integral term, right? And uh, here I'm just using one jump operator. So later there will be a simple generalization of this with many uh, uh, jump operators. And then in this derivation, they argued that uh, this noise here from the bath is a Gaussian, uh, stationary Gaussian process with mean zero. And the time correlation is exactly proportional to the bath correlation function, okay? So if you can compute this, then of course you will get C of T. But on the other hand, um, uh, this is typically in practice, this is related to what's known as the spectral density. Uh, I'll give you some examples of that. Uh, but one potential issue with working with this is that um, uh, if you use that, uh, uh, if you take the covariance matrix, this doesn't have a closed equation. Okay? And so you cannot get an exact QME. Okay? So it does, so the Edo, the Edo formula, you cannot use it here. And so you don't have a closed form of the equation. Okay? And so, um, the approach that we took, and this is like a, a trick that we used in, many, in some other uh, context, so is um, to kind of uh, break, uh, break up uh, this non, uh, sort of a non-local in time term into local ones. And so you do this by the following. So let's say that this, is a, this Gaussian process can be approximated by an OU process. Okay? So OU process is one of the simple Gaussian processes, okay? And then uh, it satisfies this simple linear SDE, right? And the time correlation of this OU process is gonna be this exponential function, but this alpha is a complex number. It doesn't have to be uh, re, uh, purely imaginary or real, okay? It's a generally a, it's a complex number. And then what that means is that um, since eta, the correlation of eta and this function C go hand in hand together, Whenever you make an approximation of eta, you're gonna be making an approximation of this c here. So effectively, you're approximating this c of t by using this exponential function, right? But of course, this could be a lousy approximation, right? Your correlation function may not look anything like this, uh, uh, this exponential function. But what you can do is you can use them as a building block. So basically, you can look for a linear combination of OU processes that approximates this Gaussian process. So I'll do that in the next slide. But, I'm, but here I wanna highlight the, what you gain by this approximation. So effectively, uh, with this C of tau being proportional to an exponential function, you can suddenly merge them. So this alpha gets, can be, uh, part of it can be absorbed into this HS. 
And then, so if you define this integral as another function, let's call it uh, an auxiliary wave function, it suddenly uh, uh, satisfies a Markovian uh, equation, right? And it, it has this Schrodinger-like structure, except that this is attached to your, uh, the wave function phi that you were working with originally, okay? So this is one way to remove the memory. So basically, you're replacing this correlation function by a sum of exponentials. Does that have a star relation? Uh, uh, it's not necessary. It's actually complex. It should be in the upper half of the complex plane. So also, this came from the pole expansion. Well, somehow feel like if the dissipation has a memory, it's now Markovian to satisfy the dissipation fluctuations to remember. The noise should also somehow be, have some memory. Right, right. So that's exactly this equation right here. So the eta here, the correlation of eta is exactly C of tau. So C of tau can have a large correlation length. So it doesn't have to be a delta function. Mm -hmm. So that's. You copy to keep the Markovian. That's right. That's right. That's right. So that's this embedding uh, trick. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. If you randomly stop the Lin-Plage in a Markovian one, do you mm -hmm. get that form? I so think that somewhere okay. right, right, right. 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 And the putting of so I think set. right the reduction to the Markovian uh, to the Lindblad equation is actually when this c is close to a delta function, so that this integral term just you know the memory just vanishes. So the, I think that's the only thing that I can think of to go from here to Lindblad. Okay, I don't know if I answered the right question. So I think you're describing. Mm -hmm. Actually, I've seen a model where they do not Markovian mm -hmm. by deriving the reset time in the, in the Markov equation. Uh -huh. I see, that I see. Very, but they, okay. didn't write this, they did not write down the stochastic equation uh -huh. coming with it, but it looks like very much I see, I see. Same. Oh, that's interesting. I have to get the reference from you later. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Compare with the classical case, we do generalized algebra. Mm -hmm. so, but now you're not doing generalized in the but doing this. Right. Mm -hmm. Is the reason because generalized in the is not uh, CPDP? Uh, so th there are two things. One is that if you start from this stochastic Schrodinger equation, just like the uh, generalized Landerman equation, generalized Landerman equation doesn't have a closed form of Fokker Planck. But generalized, you need a Landerman member. That's right. The damping part has a memory. So this one doesn't have a closed form of the quantum master equation. So it's because we just cannot use the Ito's lemma, and we cannot just eliminate. Um, OK. All right. Now, uh, so in general, of course, what you want to do is uh, you want to approximate. So, so once you introduce this uh, additional wave function and then this noise here, you can write down an extended system, and suddenly the memory goes away. Um, and then, so in general, of course, one exponential function uh, is probably a very poor approximation of your back correlation function, right? And so, um, so typically what you can do is uh, you can approximate it by a sum of exponential functions. So this is probably looks a bit similar to GN's expression, but I think this is a different problem, <laughs> the sum of exponentials. Um, and so um, the one question that I get asked a lot is like, what does C of t look like? Right, in, in practice, okay? And I don't have a specific answer because it really depends on the applications. Now, one nice paper, this JCP paper, listed a number of typical um, uh, bath correlation functions. And so the bath correlation function can be written, this, this is almost like a free integral, but uh, there's the spectral density right here. And so they listed a bunch of uh, examples in ap different applications of the spectral density, okay? And then, uh, of course, what, then what you do is do pole expansion, and you get the uh, expon sum of exponentials. So that's how, uh, you, how you can get um, these. Um, so, so you know. here in the, in their papers, you'll see. Yeah. And that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, OK. Um, so, so basically, the over, overall, what you have done is you have embedded your dynamics in a slightly bigger system. But by doing that, you come up with a Markovian system at this uh, bigger, um, in, this, uh, in this bigger space. But the problem is that uh, I mentioned before that in order to derive the quantum master equation, usually we need a linear SD, right? 
So the problem is that you have phi and zeta here, right? So this is actually nonlinear, right? So uh, we actually, so, so this could be useful for classical simulations, right? But to derive a um, sort of a, a quantum master equation, uh, what you can do is actually you can actually treat those two variables uh, uh, together and without treating the OU process uh, uh, separately. And you can derive uh, this, this extended system and you can check that this is indeed a linear uh, stochastic differential equations. Okay. So uh, you get this uh, equation by tossing away other lambda square terms. So, so basically lambda is the coupling. Right. So I mentioned that in order to, for the uh, Markovian model to apply, you need two assumptions. One is weak uh, coupling and the other one is the time correlation. So here we are actually taking into account the whole time correlation function. Uh, but in terms of lambda, the best that we have done so far is to get to order lambda uh, to the power three. So this is like getting rid of higher order terms. And so what you get is like these four additional um, and, and stochastic differential equations. Okay. Mm -hmm. but just to clarify, when you say Markovian, the, right. it means that it has SDE way of... Uh, that's right. So you, you, in general, you have a generator, but the, once, you, you, once you have the SDEs, you have the generator. But that, that Markovian is in terms of all the combined uh, states. So if you look at, look at just one of them, it's, it's not Markovian. Yeah, yeah, so right. When you say non-Markovian, it means that mm -hmm. there's some time scale you have to wait for it. Right. So, so, local time scale. so that's intuitively that's what it is, right? So there is a memory effect, right? But uh, you can also interpret this in terms of the transition density, right? So what's happening next is just depends on what's happening now. So there's no history dependence. Yes. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so one more comment. So mm -hmm. when people, I guess some people, maybe some people do like open system, they would mm -hmm. say you know the best gotta have some memory mm -hmm. time. Right. But then if you and within that time scale, it's not local. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Scale, right, right, right. You kind of look at course time scales that I you see. would still okay. say, oh no, you, there's like a, okay. you could do some time averaging is effectively sure. a, yeah, yeah. another Markovian dynamics, but not in this. Not that in could, this so that's sort of a more sort of a coarse grained view, I would say, right, right. So you can kind of look at the averages. I'm not sure what happens if you average the density operator, but you know, in, intuitively, I guess it's doable. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And so um, now later we'll show that uh, you know, this is actually going to come into the modeling error because our quantum master equation is approximating like, the combined dynamics of a system and a bat, right? So in the end, we wanna, this is going to come up in the uh, error estimate. All right, and so of course, if you have, have uh, multiple jump operators, then uh, there's going to be uh, summations here, so <laughs> over all the jump up. Oh, only, sorry, let, let me just speed up. Uh, so, uh, okay, and then, um, so in the end, uh, you derive uh, this stochastic Schrodinger, uh, 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 stochastic Schrodinger equation, and then from there, you can just build your QMU. Right? This QMU is similar to Lindblad, but it's not exactly Lindblad. Uh, of course, by construction, it uh, preserves the positivity. The initial condition is also easy to prepare, and then, so let me just, right. This is the, uh, the, the bigger Hamiltonian that you have, right? So it can extend in several directions. One is like, this is uh, in the direction where you keep on adding terms uh, in the approximation of the bad correlation function. And this direction here, you can keep on adding the number of jump operators, J1, J2, and things like that, okay. Um, all right, so there are some properties and then we also came up with this, so it's basically the same algorithm, but this is actually, this paper was finished early, earlier, and so it didn't have the Gaussian quadrature aspect, right? So you still need a, a compression scheme. And then there were some open issues, and I think let me just leave them there, so to make sure I don't go over time. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>